It's Friday Feedback Friday, the feedback is day of the week. It's Feedback Friday. I was a little slow on the blend there. And you see Momo is with me. There were some comments about Momo's circumference on the little video I posted from Twitch. And I feel the need to defend Momo's honor a bit in that regard. There's two things going on with Momo. First of all, people asking how old Momo is. Momo is six. So, whoop. Oh, oh, okay. Hi, Momo. Um, Momo is six. So he is not an elderly cat. He is just a super chill type of cat. He's a cat called a ragamuffin, um, which is a, cra a cross uh, between rag dolls, hence raga, and... Um, <sighs> street cats in the 1970s, so stray cats, uh, they're bred for temperament. There's some talk that there's some Maine Coon in them, Norwegian Forest. He's a big boy. Uh, they're all big. They all have been bred to be kind of teddy bear shaped, so round in the middle. They've got an additional fat pad on, uh, that's what it's called, Momo, in, in the reading, I'm sorry, uh, on their stomachs. Now, Momo... His weight is borderline for his breed. We do have to watch it a lot. Um, he also has chronic rhinosinusitis. So when he starts feeling less good, he moves less and he puts on weight. When he's feeling like this and feeling better, then he plays a lot more. And it's just, it's no rhyme or reason. It's up or down. It's a really frustrating condition. So we do our best with Momo, but... Um, there's only so much we can do. It is the shape he is meant to be. Um, they do warn us not to get his weight, you know, not to let it get too out of control because of, see, he's itching again because he's got allergies. Momo, don't scratch, please. Thank you. Yeah, resist. Resist, good boy. Um, ah, and he's back to scratching. Okay, stop, good. Okay. Um, Momo gets allergies the same time I do. But uh, they, they do say, watch it, don't let him gain any more um, because of things like diabetes and all that stuff. So that's something we watch for. But that is, that is the deal on Momo. But Momo is just super chill. Um, and moving on to the rest of the content. Uh, oh, I forgot to do the, uh, the Patreon stuff. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Um, this, there is a brief clip that I removed for flow where, uh, Professor Ferguson discusses how, um, the, the, um, criteria for gaming addiction could show you're addicted to anything, including cats. So considering the content on my channel, I, I just, it, it was a weird starting point. To the video itself, it it happened between uh, part two and part three. Um, it wasn't, it didn't really give any more information, but it was cute, so I gave it as a patron extra. So if you want to see that, become a patron today. Uh, it would be very appreciated um, for Momo's medical bills, among other things. Um, one person got on me for splitting it up into three parts, claiming it was it was basically click farming. And so I want to, and it was when I saw there could be other people who were grumbling about it. I did that strictly for length because a lot of people lately have been complaining about the length of my videos. I don't know why all of a sudden my videos, if anything, on the whole have gotten shorter lately. But all of a sudden there's been this uptick in people who just want to complain about my content. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to post a one hour and 45 minute single chunk of a video. I mean, I could have done that and split it up into, um, you know, put commercial breaks through it. I would have made the same amount of revenue that way. But I thought for people's, um, respecting people's time, don't give them an hour and 45 minute long chunk. And I have noticed that, you know, part one, has significantly higher views right now than part two, uh, which has the, had the most sizzly headline. Um, and part three, people just haven't had the chance to watch part three yet. And, you know, that indicates to me that I made the right call because as is, people are getting a complete experience. They can stop, they can take breaks. 
Um, cause I know too often when somebody links me to something and it's like a four hour stream of a press conference or something like that, I leave it and I come back to it because I, I don't have four hours to sit there and watch something. Um, so, you know, breaking it up was not to, to farm clicks that logic is faulty, um, because, you can put multiple ads in a lengthy video and make the same amount of money. It was strictly for, uh, out of consideration for people's time and attention spans because of the, the complaints I've been getting, um, of late. The other thing people keep saying is you should be more scripted. That is impossible. While I am working on boss fight. Scripting takes twice as long as just spitballing in a video. Because when something's scripted, it's expected to be tight and flow from one idea to the next, the next. If all I was doing was this daily, with these daily YouTube videos, different story. But right now I am doing two podcasts and a five episode, very involved web series, plus consulting stuff, plus occasional college lecturing. I have to do this one virtually because um, of COVID. The next one I do. Uh, I would love to have unlimited hours in a day. I would love to have a producer and an assistant. Um, I would love to do more of these interviews. Um, interviews do not take significantly more work. Preparing questions that I can jot down point form. Um, I, I've been interviewing so long, I can prepare for a, an interview in 20 minutes if I'm really stuck. Um, you know, the next one I'm doing for one of my podcasts required me to read a book. So that took longer. Uh, but, you know, that just means I re read that book as opposed to another book I'm reading at that time. I can find the time for that. Um, but I am really rotten at figuring out who to interview. Um, some person, oh, a commenter mentioned doing podcasts on gaming philosophy. I would, sorry, interviews on game philosophy. I would love to interview game devs on that sort of thing. I interviewed Lori Cole for a podcast series on the FU Network, Quest for Glory creator, uh, co-creator. Um, I would love to do more of that stuff. The reason I do not do more of that stuff is the stuff I talked about in... Um, in the interview with Professor Ferguson, access. You don't get access to game developers unless they've got something to promote. They very rarely, if they are still active, will talk to you when they're not promoting something because they don't want to get in trouble in the press and say something that are going to affect the jobs of 45 people. So games press stuff is very tightly controlled. If you know somebody who you'd like me to interview and you have an in so you can directly access them, I will interview them. No problem. The fact that I have not done more developer interviews is strictly access. That was one of the things I loved doing at E3 back in the day. You could get, I mean, I got to interview Richard Garriott. Well, sorry, General British for Tabula Rasa. That way I got to sit in a round table with, um, I always get his name wrong, Warren Spector. Um, I always confuse him and Phil Spector. Phil Spector's the music producer, I think. Anyway, uh, I got to interview, uh, you know, I got to interview behind closed doors Cliffy B that way. Uh, I first met Todd Pappy that way. E3 used to be great for that. And then it became less and less great about that. And E3 gradually lost its purpose. Now, granted, I only had like 20 minutes with them then, but it was still 20 minutes. It was 20 minutes in a group. I could ask two or three questions, but I could, I could choose meaningful questions. And it was really wonderful. Of course, most of the stuff I, I asked them, I couldn't find a way to work in a coverage because meaningful coverage in games during E3 just doesn't happen. But I learned a lot. 
um, and at least I could exp express um, appreciation for what they were doing through the questions. Um, people get very excited when you seem to understand what they do. Um, but games marketing has become increasingly, whoop, it shrunk not in dollar values, but in access that reporters get, are granted to game devs. The money goes into, um, you know, social media, street teams, web streams, that kind of stuff, stuff they can very tightly control and it's direct to community. There's nobody challenging them. There's nobody, um, you know, getting the least bit critical. It's very, very, very tightly controlled because video games are not like, say, politics or police service or, you know, any sort of public utility that when something is paid for with taxpayer dollars, there is a certain right to access by the press because of oversight. Now, granted, various, various politicians respect that right to access principle more or less than others, but there is still a public right to know principle, which means it is easier to get access provided you have the correct press credentials. That is not so in video games. Even getting the correct press credentials is increasingly difficult at E3 because just so many people go. PAX used to be great for that. I, when I was at PAX last late summer, early fall, it is not the show that I remember. PAX, I remember the first time I went to PAX, like, oh wow, you can just walk in and talk to Chet from Valve and you can just walk in. Like if a booth was there, there was some sort of developer there. You could talk to them. They were way less on their guard than E3. It was great. I did not find that to be the case at, at PAX this time around. It was, it was more corporate. And I think that's because it's just these shows have become so big. And there's like multiple PAX events that happen throughout the year. So there is an issue in gaming that... And, and like I said, unless you're like a Jason Schreier at Kotaku, um, unless you're one of those, in any other business, it's like 40 or so names that have access. In games journalism, it's more like 10 or 20. And the weird thing is I've talked to developers who are like, you know, we don't even like this guy or we don't even like that guy, but, you know, Polygon gets clicks, Kotaku gets clicks, they're assholes, but we have to talk to them. And I'm like, no, you don't. And then it turns out, no, it's not up to them. Their PR people say they have to talk to them. And I, I think that's, that's a failing of PR departments because the truth is that any article published, any interview done, it's a search engine optimization thing. So some, somebody's more likely searching for that developer than that article. You know, because people are rabid about games and they consume news leading up to the game. So a well done interview that gets fewer clicks, but results in more conversions, meaning people who actually either take active interest in or buy your product because they didn't write something snarky for controversy clicks. That is going to be better for you than going to the usual suspects you know are going to take pot shots or amp up the controversy in a finished document. The devs know this. They do. It's the PR departments that some game devs are terrified of because marketing and PR are empowered to give them shit. Um, you know, it, it's a... It's a, it's a race to the bottom in its current form. Now, I don't see the direct-to-consumer marketing changing. It's just too easy to control. Um, but there's always workarounds, right? There's always friends and friends of friends who can refer things. So like I said, if you have some access to somebody um, and you want me to interview them, Put it in their ear. I mean, the the Christopher Ferguson interview happened um, because 
uh, I got a press release from his university about the paper. I happened to already be aware of the research because I read it when Brad put it up at the time. So it was easy to set up. It was like arranged and shot in like three or four days. I think we established contact on a Monday and we recorded it on the Friday. If they were all so easy, I'd be able to do an interview like every other week in that format. Um, I'd love to do that. I enjoy doing the interviews. I like having more time during the week because I don't have to put on like camera ready makeup when I'm just editing another part of a clip. That's what goes into it. Now, the actual comments on the video. There were a lot of interesting things. There, there was great positivity in terms of the numeric feedback, the like, dislike. Relatively few comments for one of my videos, which is interesting. Um, two comments, I thought, summarize thinking, I'm gonna do two individual comments and then I'm going to talk about, I saw a particular thing coming up again and again and again and again. Oh, I'm sorry, three. Three comments plus the, the general trend. I'll leave the general trend to the end. So one was a discussion of the, the complete lack of nuance regarding how we talk about um, things that are gendered men's issues, women's issues, um, a complete, I'll, I'll repeat myself, lack of nuance on the subject of harassment and intimate partner violence. You will notice when I talk about these topics, I neuter them in terms of gender. You know, intimate partner violence is not violence against women. It's intimate partner violence. Um, just because... More women report, like, just because the violence becomes bad enough to seek medical attention and or police intervention, just because it happens to women more often than men, does not mean it's a women's issue. And I'll say again, I think that it's actually holding, addressing, really getting to the root causes of intimate partner violence when we do gender it. Because as long as we continue to have this benevolently sexist dichotomy that, um, you know, women are sort of default, quote unquote, natural victims in society and men are expected, as, as Jolly Yellow says, to suffer in silence for the sake of women, um, we're not going to solve these issues. We're not. We're still going to have these cyclical uh, uh, mental health pressure cooker issues. Um, and I, it's really interesting to me because, you know, obviously I do a lot of reading on feminism and I do a lot of stuff regarding issues regarding women. Um, a lot of my personal experiences could have left me extremely bitter when it comes to the treatment of women in the entertainment industry, quite frankly, I think that the reason that I'm not bitter is I found gaming as a as an industry. And this is part of the reason that I'm I take things on the chin. I have suffered damage to my own reputation because I defend gaming in comparative terms. You know, compared to film and TV and radio, gaming's a freaking cakewalk for women. The only thing that I think are, are real barriers to getting more women working in games are the hours, meaning the lack of work-life balance, and the job security. These are both things, meaning, you know, crunch is a problem, cyclical layoffs are a problem. Um, otherwise, I think it's a, it's a great, industry for women because there isn't the people talk a lot about the toxic masculinity in, in in game dev it is it is baby portions compared to what goes on in film and television and even radio radio oh radio's bloody awful 
in that regard. There are some wonderful people working in radio, but its structures are brutal. Um, but, you know, we know that um, women, because over a certain age, women tend to still be the primary uh, caregivers of children, they need a job that doesn't require 80 hour days. Um, they also, job security is in, in many papers I've read much more important. Women will take less salary, um, if the job is more secure. And that's the exact opposite of what game dev is. And I, I really don't think it has to be an insecure job in, in more and more places. The jobs are more secure. It's getting better. The crunch the crunch is keeping women out of game dev. It's not cultural issues. It's, it's workplace conditions, right? If you've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old at home and you're the primary caregiver, and this is true whether the primary caregiver is male or the primary caregiver is female. If you're the one that has agreed to be responsible for those children, your workplace does not offer daycare and doesn't let you bring your kids to work, people are not gonna be able to stay in that job because once the, you know, after school, the two-year-old's not even in um, after school daycare. Uh, up here, we have all day kindergarten for, for four-year-olds, um, but uh, some, some, some places do. Uh, but, you know, if you're a parent and you have to be home, you have to be home. And so either these workplaces have got to become more kid friendly or you have to ease up on the hours. It can't be both. I mean, I didn't realize when I was a kid how fortunate I was that my mother's workplace, which was a university, um, faculty of science in a university, let us come after school and just sit there, you know, in a corner in her office um, as long as we were quiet. You know, they even gave us stuff to do sometimes like, hey, can you collate this stuff or something like that? Um, that that was normalized for me. We weren't in the way people seemed to find it enjoyable. Um, you know, I was so shy. People didn't even really know I was there sometimes. But that allowed my mother as a single parent to work, work late sometimes if she had to and raised to, you know, I was 12 when my parents split. So I was old enough to stay home by myself. My sister wasn't. Um, and there were numerous reasons why, you know, it, it was a real benefit to have an understanding workplace in that regard. I, you know, I think it would be kind of cool if kids could be in video game studios. You'd have a really easy source of play testers. I understand that confidentiality issues would be something of an issue. I think those are somewhat overdone. Um, but again, have a daycare facility. It's, these are the sorts of things that the content is not the problem. The culture is not the problem. It's, it's structural, it's, it's workplace stuff that is really the issue. And we need men. We need everybody to speak up about these issues and make it about them. Or we get pigeonholed into, oh, it's just natural that women don't like these things. And, and people who believe that stuff, they're never going to not believe it. You cannot persuade them. We have to work with the people who are persuadable. And the only way to do that is to not make women seem like a very different thing. Men have to start being more honest in gaming and speaking up and admitting that they don't like it either. And I have seen more and more game devs, I've spoken to male game devs say, no, I hate crunch. I will not do any more than minor crunch. You know, I, I uh, often hear from people like working till eight, three days a week for about a month. That's my limit. I won't do more than that. I will not get sick anymore for my job. Um, this has got to be something that 
the game developers and and the companies work the hell out and the publishers the publishers have a massive role uh in terms of of deadlines you know ea being more worried about their balance sheet and the quality of their products and so on and so forth um it's getting better it is it's not at a critical mass yet that game dev is a good fit for anybody that wants a life outside of game dev but we're getting better um and i feel very strongly about this the other comment from chris w a commenter who's frequently high quality as well um made a comment that gamergate was many things to me right now it was a fight between people that could not articulate their concern well against people great at making any criticism towards them the act of evil people and then they said trusted media was something we took for granted two points there um it's a very interesting summary of people that could not articulate the concern well against people great at making any criticism toward them the act of evil people from my experiences covering gamergate and not having a side despite what some people had said that was very true one of the things that really hamstrung the pro gamergate side was a real inability to articulate a message and part of that again was structural this leaderless movement meant they had very great great difficulties in message cohesion the other problem was anybody could use a hashtag and so people could get there and troll liberally you couldn't check what what a person was or who they were or what they believed just they went hashtag gamergate they could say anything they wanted and people read a lot in there was a real messaging problem and i remember i talked to people who were sort of on the organizational side and they were like we know and then i'd hear things like we expect to lose this or basically just this is all we can do and i admit i found that really frustrating because to me don't fight unless you're fighting to win that's my mantra i understand why people just felt the need to defend the hobby they loved um even though it was a losing proposition in their minds uh but it made me very sad when people cared legitimately about things that had nothing to do with hating women and they were smeared and they knew they were being smeared and they might have some indelicate turns of phrase or some learned sort of sexist behaviors that they didn't really know what they did this is all stuff that's addressable right but it's gotta start with i know you're not a bad person let me indi let me give you a little bit of information on where that saying you're use you're using comes from and how it lands in different people and most people when they were given something that made sense to them acknowledged the other point of view you're not going to get that when you're telling someone they're evil like this they're evil gamers are evil you are your audience is not gamers your your faction is not gamers i don't know who it is but you're sacrificing the core fan the core consumer in this industry for I don't know what and this brings me to the other thing i saw over and over and over again in the comments of all three videos it kept coming up like too many people to call out to call out the names of the various people who brought this up and it came up with you know the who it came up with anita sarkeesian it came up with games journalism writ large it wasn't the opinions per se that was the problem it was the lack of trust and transparency that it didn't matter whether people agreed with a particular point or not it was that they considered the person to be a bad actor now Anita Sarkeesian got singled out for this because somebody found some recording of a presentation that she made uh, when she was in college, I think, saying, I'm not a gamer. Um, I saw it. I can see why that would um, 
hit people the wrong way. I was just like, okay, she wasn't a gamer then. Maybe she considers herself a gamer now. I... It is, it is cause for concern. It is not um, uh, disqualifying in my mind. If she said it in 2013, different story, right? That happened on the pro and anti sides in Gamergate. I mean, Miley Yiannopoulos wrote awful, awful anti-gamer pieces referring to people playing Grand Theft Auto in yellowed underpants and stuff like that. I mean, people just found these figureheads, these avatars, and I, I admit I still don't understand why people flocked to who they did. Now, I was, I think there's a lot of people where I was originally supportive of Anita Sarkeesian, um... And I don't know Anita Sarkeesian per personally. I probably never will. She avoids me like the plague, even as she steals an occasional talking point from me. But when she originally crowdfunded the Tropes vs. Women Kickstarter, I thought it was great. I wrote an article in support of the whole thing because I made the Alan Moore mistake. Um, you know, Alan Moore and Watchmen, that he thought he'd write Watchmen and it would be a thing, and then other people would go, and they'd write their thing. It wasn't Watchmen, it would be something else, but it would be equally authentic and cool, and we'd have this great diversity of thought and comics and a new golden age. And all everybody did was copy Watchmen. Well, we had a similar issue with Tropes versus Women. Instead of it being a very healthy, okay, Tropes versus women has their opinion. I make lady bits and it is treated as equally valid. Um, even though it, it takes the other side a lot of issues. There is some overlap, but it takes another side. Because women as people and individuals have different ideas. And this is where we get into the sexist thinking that truly affects gaming. And this is, this is a problem in general culture. I've seen this so many times in consulting. Well, what do women want? Women are people. What do men want? And what well, men want sports and men want cars. And no, not all men do. You're, you're not gonna, um, you know, you're not gonna attract a Fire Emblem Fates player with sports and cars. There are different demographics. You know, if it's an RPG, for instance, you don't market to the shooter crowd, right? This is the problem with games like um, Halo Wars that try to jump genres. Um, Rabbids, uh, Rabbids Mario Kingdom Battle was more successful, I think in part because Mario's jumped genres all the time in the past with Dr. Mario and Mario Kart and so on. It's, oh, the Canadian came out there, Mario. Um, but... Um, we don't go, what do men want? You see men, black men, Latino men, gay men, you know, you, women get flattened in, in this understanding. Women are individuals. Women don't, there are conservative women. There are liberal women. There are moderate women. There are libertarian women. There are scientifically minded women. There are women who can't do algebra. Okay, who dropped math in grade 10 or whatever you could drop back then. There is no one thing that women want. And I've found that when you can't give an easy answer that way, they shut down, they don't want to hear it, they get completely freaked out because it seems like a lot of people in game dev just want not to get in trouble with women. And the truth is, look at the way male gamers... Uh, some cohort of male gamers complain about everything. You have to figure out who you're going to piss off and who you're going to cater to. And sometimes catering to this group is achieved by pissing off that group, right? Women are the same way. A woman who's going to get really into... Um, Overwatch, for instance, or Destiny. Um, I've got a friend who's really into Destiny. She couldn't get into Mass Effect. Too many cutscenes, too much dialogue, all that stuff. You'd think 
the games are the same, but no, they play fundamentally differently. Now, granted, she started on Mass Effect 3 and didn't know what was going on, but just because something's a sci-fi shooter does not mean it's going to appeal to all people. The way the games play is super important, but the distribution method of games is also important. Women play a lot of Facebook games because they're free to play. You know, it's microtransactions, but they're free, meaning you can sample them before you buy. Why is this important to women? Because think about the other things we buy. We try on shoes before we buy them. We try on clothes before we buy them. We, tr we sample makeup and shampoo, and we get samples for pretty much everything we buy in the supermarket. There are free samples of products. Women are very, very used to a sample economy. We are a try before we buy. I've seen this with when my husband does the shopping and I do the shopping. I'll go in and I'll either research products um, or, oh, there's a sample of something or there's a sample size or there's a coupon or something like that. I'll try it. I am being incentivized to try this product or there's a, there's a feature of the product I'm interested. In. He'll come home with these random just things. Oh, I thought I'd try it. And sometimes, of course, it'll sit and you won't even open it. I'm not saying this gender is the only factor here, but that's consistent with, with research about shopping patterns. Um, and that's why women being household influencers is so critical and how it's changed marketing a lot. Um, but if video games really want female audiences, there's got to be some sort of try before you buy principle, which means bring back game demos. And you want to get a developer mad at you, suggest that. Oh, it's, it's too much work. It's, it's pulling people off the team. It's, it's... Guys, do you want to do this or don't you? You know, people will happily create a game demo for a new IP. They just don't want to create game demos for ongoing IPs because, oh, you have to pull somebody off another project. To me, that says everything is on fire at your, at your production, at, 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 your, at your studio. If you can't afford somebody to be polishing a demo for a month, you're behind and probably shouldn't be sticking to the deadline you've got right now. And I understand that people feel forced, all that stuff, burn rate, money, working at very small margins, all that stuff. I get it. But you can put all the features in a game that you want. You're not going to attract a large female consumer base unless there's some sort of try before you buy principle. And I think that's a better consumer practice for everyone, right? I mean, um, fan fiction communities bring people in. Fan art communities bring people in. These are still creating a familiarity with the brand and its characters before they spend, up here it's $80 on a video game. Not all of this is possible for financial reasons. I understand that, but some of it is. And I'm not saying people should be forced to make games and want a sizable female player base. I'm not saying that. There's a lot of bad logic who warps things I say out there right now. What I am saying is that if you give lip service to wanting female players but aren't willing to do the things structurally that are actually going to, to incentivize a female player base, you're not going to get female players. And you may alienate um, your existing player base with awkward pandering. And we hear this a lot. And I think some of the breakdown of trust, the perception of bad actors, has something to do with this. I think there is some just shady practices out there. But I think in general, game companies have got to be a bit more humble about the fact that a base investment for a AAA game is a lot of money.
It's basically a pair of shoes and I cannot believe how expensive shoes are for how long they last. Okay. That matters. That is meaningful. And nobody buy very few people buy pairs of shoes without the ability to try them on, right? Games are the same way. These are ex ex expensive things. You know, not only do you have the initial $70, $80 purchase price, but then the DLC, ideally they want you to push up. They want those whale players to spend 120 bucks with DLC and in-app purchases and all that stuff. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money on something that is not protecting your feet, protecting you from the cold, feeding you, housing you, all that stuff. And so I totally get why people want a better understanding of what they're getting before they buy. Now, Twitch is a great service for this because people can observe gameplay, right? See what's going on, see, see what plays before they dive in. That's awesome. But the marketing departments have got to get more on the ball in this regard. Um, people treat games like other media, movie tickets, Netflix, all that stuff. Even Netflix has, has a 30-day trial. I think game, game subscriptions might help. But again, do people play a lot? Game subscriptions only benefit you if you play a lot. Um, and then the investment in the console itself is pricey. So this is something to talk about. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I just know what the data says. And because I'm interested in data, my conclusions are significantly different than people interested in narratives and theories. And this video has gone on very long. See, I went longer than a half an hour and people are like, why is she talking so much? It was a big feedback week, but I'm gonna stop now. There's a lot more I wanted to talk about and there was just no time. So I'm gonna stop now and get back to work on Boss Fight. Uh, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. Patrons, the, the previews are going to start. It was going to be this week, but then there was a special clip. I've started editing, so you're going to see some stuff next week. Get re I think it's pretty funny. I'm interested in what you think. Um, and there's going to be an opportunity for patrons to participate in episode one of Boss Fight coming up. So become a patron today, patreon.com slash Anna Thanks for watching.